Welcome. I'm Kristen Gilger, Senior Associate Dean here at Cronkite, um, and I'm here to welcome um, you to a very special Must See Mondays event. Tonight we have Jennifer Greer to lead a discussion about the importance of diversity and equity efforts in, within journalism education. Jennifer is president of the Association of Education in Journalism and Mass Communications. Say that fast five times. An organization of people throughout the world whose goal it is is to educate the next generation of journalism and mass communi communications professionals. It's an organization that's been doing this work since 1912, and it has grown into the oldest and largest um, alliance of college journalism and mass communication uh, educators in the world. And if you can't find any of your professors in the middle of August, it's because we're all at an AJMC conference this year in DC. Um, in addition to being president of AJMC, Jennifer is Associate Provost for Administration at the University of Alabama. She's been a teacher and administrator there for more than 18 years. She previous, previously taught at the University of Nevada and the University of Florida, and she has taught and written about gender issues and has helped lead AJMC's diversity efforts. Jennifer started out as a business reporter at the Kansas City Star, and she was managing editor of the Gainesville, Florida Sun's first online edition. Jennifer is going to tell you about a very special honor that the Cronkite School has been given, the AJMC Diversity and Inclusion Award. This is an award given every year to a one journalism program in the country that has uh, successfully increased its equity and diversity. We've had our fair share of awards here at the Cronkite School, but none is more important to us than this one. Diversity is the cornerstone of everything we do at Cronkite, from speakers to curriculum to our high school programs, professional programs like our Spanish Language News Bureau, and our recruitment. 40% of our students are now minority, and that's a number that we want to continue to grow. Uh, Jennifer is going to tell you more about that, and then she's going to lead a discussion with our three panelists, three Cronkite faculty members who have championed diversity in their professional careers and continue to do so here at the Cronkite School. So we have, I have to do this in order, uh, uh, Sharon Bramlett Solomon, who has been um, a instructor here at Cronkite since 1986. I think we've got that right. Uh, and she teaches a number of courses related to uh, diversity uh, for many years in person and now primarily online. And she's written about this issue and really helped uh, drive um, the, um, the discussion here at Cronkite. We also have uh, Christina Leonard next to her, and Christina is executive editor of our Cronkite News Operation, which does a lot of diversity coverage uh, in the Valley, and she came to us from, actually in the state, right? And Christina came to us from the Arizona Republic, where she was a longtime uh, reporter and editor. And finally, we have uh, Vanessa Ruiz, who is another Cronkite News Director who heads up our Borderlands Reporting Bureau. And she also has a long professional background. Uh, she came to us from Channel 12, uh, 12 News here in Phoenix, where she was the anchor. And she also worked on air for TV stations in Miami and Los Angeles and at Telemundo uh, reporting around the world. So I'm done. Uh, please welcome Jennifer Greer and our panelists. Thank you. Okay, first of all, I just want to thank you all for being here, and I'm guessing that um, some of you may be getting extra credit, which is awesome. Um, get extra credit and learn about diversity at the same time, so that is like a win-win. Um, so f I want to thank the Cronkite School for inviting me to come visit with them. One of the great things about being president of this association is I get to do fun things like this. I get to travel around the country and meet different people involved in journalism and mass communication education. And 
and highlight good things that are going on. So when we talked about this session, um, we were kind of brainstorming what we should do. Um, and I thought that there would be nothing more fitting than highlighting some of the good work that is done at the Cronkite School that earned this award. Um, and so as you heard, this is an annual award that is given by AEJMC, which is the largest association of journalism educators in the world, journalism and mass communication educators in the world. We started giving this award in 2009. Schools apply um, by they put a packet of their diversity efforts, and that those diversity efforts span a three-year period. And what we look for in selecting the award is not just somebody who has the best numbers, but somebody who has made the most strides in diversity, where you can sh demonstrate a measurable um, success rate of how you've done um, improved numbers, um, infused diversity in the curriculum, reached out to underrepresented groups in um, it, for students, for faculty. So I'm going to highlight just a couple of, of things that stood out as the selection committee was giving ASU this award for its efforts. Um, the first thing is the, the number that you heard, nearly 40% of the students are, are uh, coming from a minority population. That is really unheard of in our JMC programs, and it does, um, it, it, it is a significant increase over what the school had just even a decade ago. And I think some of our panelists are going to talk about their experiences in seeing um, the, the student body become more diverse, and not only becoming more diverse, but retaining students. So you're attracting diverse students um, and retaining them from the freshman to sophomore rate is 93%, which that means Yet, or 97 percent, I think it's actually 97, which again is one of those numbers that's so high we can't fathom it, um, but it's keeping your freshman students to your sophomore students, that means 97 percent of them come back um, the next year and continue on in the program, which means that you're doing something right in the freshman year, getting people excited about the major and making sure that they have the skill set to, to make them successful in the major. Some other things that stood out to the committee were um, some of the partnerships that the school has um, engaged in. So they have partnerships with, for example, the Arizona Latino Media Association, the Native American Journalism Association. Um, they have uh, started student chapters for LGBTQ plus, uh, A plus students. Um, I think the first student chapter for lesbian and gay journalists in the country was at ASU, is that correct? Um, and so again, it's, a, it's overall efforts, not just one metric. It's what are you doing across everything that you do in your outreach to communities, in how you teach your students, how you recruit faculties, the type of work that your students are doing, where they're going to work. Um, and so I'm going to sum up uh, with the award by talking about what the committee said. Um, when making the selection, the AEJMC committee noted that equity and diversity, and I quote, have become a way of life at the Cronkite School. This has resulted in a broad uh, definition of diversity that infuses student and faculty recruitment, curriculum design, content, and outreach activities, um, and a, a high student retention rate. So again, it's not something that you do, it's who you are. And that is something that is very you know, I, I just got chills when I said that, um, that, you know, we always will hear about who's, you know, doing diversity. Diversity is not something you do. It's something that you embody and, and, and it infuses everything that you do. So we are fortunate tonight to have three of your outstanding faculty to talk about their experiences um, with diversity and why this matters. So I'm going to end my formal part of the presentation, sit down, and we're just going to have a conversation, and we will leave some time at the end for questions from the audience, um, but I, I think this is really cool for you guys to hear from the faculty some of the efforts that are going on that brought ASU to the attention of AEJMC for this award. So with that, I'm going to pitch my first question, then I'll have a seat. Um, how do you guys, um, for each one of you very quickly, how do you define diversity? What is, what is the definition? And we'll start with Sharon. So how do you define diversity? Diversity <clears throat> is a reflection of who we are as a society. When we think about diversity, it should embrace the image 
of this nation. The Kerner Commission called it, um, well, going before the Kerner Commission, um, the Hutchins Commission in 1947, in the first study of the press, called a free and responsible press, uh, set out five, five conditions of a free and responsible press, and one of them was that, uh, besides that the press should report all the news that's fit for today, and it's a, one of them was that the press should reflect all constituent groups of society by gender, race, ethnicity, cultural groups, uh, sexual orientation, um, social class, which is often left out. Um, so geographical distinctions. So I will say that diversity embraces all constituent groups as a society that should be reflected when you're trying to meet a mission of inclusion. Um, I mean, I think you summed it up really well. I mean, it's a vast array of um, all different sorts of things, who we are, um, no matter what age we are, what race we are, um, and even small little things about the, you know, ideology that we believe in. Um, I think all of that is reflected in great coverage and the people who we hire um, and in our very great diverse uh, students. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think I agree definitely with your definition. Um, but in, and you're right, really reflecting society and all levels of it and even the people we might not reach, um, those who are underserved, so yeah. Well, for me, diversity is not a percentage, it's not a quota that needs to be filled. Uh, it really comes down to basics for me. And what does that mean? It means people that come from different backgrounds, different cultures, um, different kinds of heritage. Because, and I like to relate it specifically when it comes to journalism. What we do is we cover, or we should cover, all different kinds of people. And in order to do that, well and properly and accurately, you need people that will come to the table with different perspectives, different ideas, different ways of seeing things. Because if you don't have that, then your coverage will be very limited. And so I think it's incredibly important, again, very basic and simple for me. Different people, different ideas, perspectives, and thoughts coming together and sharing those ideas and perspectives and how can we make this better? How can we be more accurate? How can we be more fair? And how can we be more inclusive to go ahead and represent the folks who live in our communities? That to me is what diversity is. Okay, um, and I wanna turn to kind of talking about your efforts in the school, some of the things that you have done. I will tell you, um, when I was a new professor at the University of Nevada in Reno, um, we had a dean and we were coming up on our um, ACE JMC accreditation, which is the body that accredits ASU and many other journalism programs around the country. And uh, he, he noted, he was a fairly new dean and said, we don't have a diversity course in our curriculum. So um, we need somebody who can do that. And so I'm eager to please my new boss. And I'm like, I'll do it. I'll, I'll I, you know, I really hadn't had a whole lot of background in that. Uh, Sharon was asking me what my dissertation was on. And I had been a business reporter. I had studied uh, political communication. I had not really experienced, um, you know, looking into the studies or teaching diversity. but got into this class, which we called Race, Gender, and Media, and it was an elective. Um, I believe now it's a required class for all of the students there. Um, and it was just so eye-opening, some of the experiences that I had been blind to throughout my career as a journalist and as an educator up to that point. So with that, I'm gonna ask you about your experiences. And again, I'm gonna start with Sharon, just because you have been here, I think, since the late 80s, um, of your experiences in a journalism program um, with diversity, teaching diversity, um, being a diverse faculty member. Okay, so when I got my PhD from Indiana University and I was hired here, 
uh, at Arizona State University, first time I had come to the desert. And um, the first thing that I um, was aware of was how homogenous this um, uh, the, the the school was the the uh, in terms of faculty, in terms of students and staff at Arizona State University, the Cronkite School. So, in the early '90s, I organized an association of multicultural journalists. Okay. Before I say that, let me segue because <laughs> I had a prepared speech. <laughs> um, it's it's great to have this award. This, this award is phenomenal. It's coveted. It's, um, it's an outstanding award. It's saying that the Cronkite St St School is doing something very right. Um, I talked to my colleagues. I talked to Vanessa and Christina, and we were saying, this is wonderful. But let me just make sure you understand right from the get-go, right now, that the Cronkite School has this award, but the Cronkite School has a lot of work to do. Where do we go from here? Because after we look at the statistics, we can see we're not done yet, okay? We can't stop here. We have work to do. And I'll tell you how we have work to do. So let me get back to, I came here, uh, and the first thing that I organized uh, in terms of diversity, our diversity mission was an association of multicultural journalists. And I organized this association for about four good reasons. And in you, right now, I can see students in, in we were in Stauffer Hall and the Tempe campus before we came here um, in 2008. Um, I organized the association because there was no association. I came to the school, as many of these women will also uh, tell you, as a first in many ways, groundbreaking in many ways. They have groundbreaking stories. You have groundbreaking stories. You were the first. You were the first of something or many things. So I was the first person of color. I was the first faculty woman of color. I was the first African American of color. I was the first to organize an association where we began to keep up with statistics regarding our demographics of race, gender, you know, geographical area, and so on. So I organized the association so that for those reasons, because there was none. We needed to keep up with those, uh, with the with the complexion of who we are, and keep up with the demographics. Secondly, um, I was just weary of students saying, I, "I I need experience. Where do I go? What do I do?" I said, "We have the State Press. We have the State Press Magazine. We have the Blaze Radio. We have South Winds. We have the Campus Media." And they said, "They don't want us." Students would say this, and not necessarily all students of color. Just students who. You know, said, oh, you know, I don't want to go to State Press. The State Press at that time was kind of down in the basement. They said, well, they, they have a click. They don't want us to join. They don't want people of color. They don't welcome us. All they do is hang out together. They eat together. They, they, they hang out together. They, they, they go out together. They sleep together. They do everything together. Well, maybe not sleep together, but they do a lot of stuff together. And I said, but you need the experience. So when I organized the association, it brought <coughs> students from campus-wide, from all majors, to be invited in a group where they felt welcome to get on and off campus media experience and where they uh, felt welcome and, and promoting the idea of not just experience, but you belong here and you have a role to play here and, 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 and we want you to stay here and graduate. So, so that's why I started. So that's a pioneer um, uh, move in, in starting this association. I'm, Again, I know all of these ladies have a first when they came here. Fast forward to where we are now, and yes, move from 12% uh, from the ground floor to what, 40%, almost 40% 40, yeah. 40 students of color. And, and faculty ranks, you said you were the first, um, now 27% of the faculty. Okay, so faculty, involving yeah. faculty, for example, uh, I was, eventually it became three women and uh, when Chris Callahan, the dean, got here, there were three women, so that was 25%. Now he says it's, it's, it's 44% oh, women, right. so I think. 44%? Was, that's great. Yeah. That's phenomenal. 10 years, 12 years, what, it became 20, 25? Yeah, he's 13. been here about 12 yeah, years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's phenomenal. That's great. That's great statistics. However, 
more to do. We have more to do, I'm just gonna say this, yeah. because our students are dominated by women. Two thirds of our students are women. So if two thirds of our students are women and we have four to four percent, we can do more, right? If, and if, if that is yeah, the case. and that is the case in most journalism most programs journalism schools, around yeah. the country. We've done well. That it's largely female. The um, most of them have not breached the fifty percent barrier on the faculty for female. Right, yeah. right. But right. we're getting close. We're right, right. we're making strides. So, so we've made great progress. Okay, so I'm going to turn to now. Which one of you has been here longer, Vanessa or Christine? Christine. Okay, so your experience, um, kind of, um, and so we can go back to your professional experience because both of you have recently come from the profession. Talk about your experiences with diversity and how that's kind of shaped the way you view things. <laughs> Do you want to start? Sure. I, well, I will say that, uh, you know, kudos to Sharon, because certainly she's been here for a long time, sort of spearheading a lot of these diversity and inclusion efforts, uh, paving the way for the rest of us. Um, my personal experience, is, and this is something that we spoke about earlier today, is, is a bit different, because <clears throat> I was born in Miami, Florida, which is a very multicultural, diverse, and very integrated community. I went to high school in Europe, and I grew up uh, part of my formative years in South America with my family. So I grew up in this sort of utopian idea that the world was just diverse, and everybody lived side by side and integrated, and, and again, very utopian, but I cling to that, obviously now knowing better. I don't want to let go of that, because I believe that that's the way it should be. That's the way it should be everywhere, no matter where we are. And so that's one of the things that I certainly try to teach and show my students um, as the director of Borderlands. Uh, diversity is my bread and butter. That's what I do every single day. We cover stories, yes, as the title says, Borderlands, border issues, immigration, DACA, Dreamers, you name it. But the other thing that we also do on a daily basis and that I push my students to do is look beyond just those issues and let's cover other communities that are minorities in our area, LGBTQ issues, refugee issues, because those stories also should and need to be told. So that's some of the things that we do at Borderlands on a daily basis at Cronkite News. And then in addition to that, I'm part of the team that helps to lead our Cronkite Noticias program, which is our professional Spanish speaking program. And one of the things that I always like to clarify with students because they come and tell me, well, I don't really want to be pigeonholed as a Spanish reporter or, you know, Spanish is not really my first language. You know what? That's okay. I mean, that's why you're here. We're here to help you sharpen those skills that will ultimately ultimately make you a better reporter, English and Spanish, you know, and it doesn't even have to be in Spanish. If you can speak and work in another language, whatever that may be, it will only help you be a better journalist down the road because you'll be able to work in different kinds of communities, different kinds of perspectives and approaches to stories. Be that one person in the newsroom who says, hey guys, you know what, I think we're missing something here. Um, and so that's a lot of, those are a lot of the conversations that I have on a daily basis with my students. And then quite frankly, on a very personal level, it has struck me very much since I arrived here just this past August, I've had some students come up to me uh, in tears saying, you know, I'm ashamed of speaking Spanish in, in public, or I was taught not to, or I feel less than. And again, that's where I reach into my utopian background. And I say, no, 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 no. Let's have a conversation and let's talk about what's really going on. And I take that very seriously because, it, you know, there's no reason why anybody should be feeling less than. And I know that sounds very cliched and it touches upon a lot of the issues that we're talking about now, both local and national headlines, but I think that's really what sets the Cronkite School apart, that the leadership here also recognizes the importance of that and of having those kinds of conversations with students. And then they bring in faculty such as this and others on staff to have those kinds of dialogues with our students. I mean, for me, I think the lesson that I've sort of learned over the years is just really not to become complacent about diversity and diversity issues. Um, when I started at the Republic, um, we had a much larger staff, um, and although things weren't perfect, there was always room to improve, um, you know, we immediately banded together, and it's probably been, what, 15 years now? I um, 
helped launch a diversity committee within the republic and so you know our job there was to look out for diversity issues and it was everything from <clears throat> the topics we were covering to the reporters we were recruiting um, when there is an issue with management or there is some decision that was made that um, the diversity committee took issue with we'd bring those to leadership and, and have a great discussion we'd bring in people from the community um, to ha you know a as an educational component um, and then over you know that diversity committee still still happens it still goes on but things have changed so much since back then I think um, back then diversity was a real you know cornerstone and I'd like to say um, it's it still is and I do think they still prioritize diversity but you know the, the staff is much smaller um, when you look at the leadership there um, are not quite as many um, diverse leaders there. Um, and so then, you you know, for, for me personally, I come to a place like um, Cronkite, and, you know, it, it is a place where, and I think you said it, that diversity is sort of ingrained in what we do um, from the ground up. And, and, you know, for me, it's not something that I necessarily think about every day in the sense that I'm going to champion diversity today. It's something that you just do automatically because you believe in it and you believe that's the right thing to do. And so from, you know, everything, for, you know, you talk about our retention rate. Well, part of that is um, working very closely with the students and making sure that you all understand that we care, that we're here for you, we want you to feel comfortable, and if you see a problem, that you bring it to our attention. Um, so that, to me, speaks to not to get complacent. When you, you see something that's just not right or somebody makes a comment that you're speaking up and, um, you know, as we become more diverse um, as a society, it becomes more important to sort of raise your hand um, um, when you look to your leaders and say, you know what, Th you know, that's not right because the chances of you sort of like, you know, grouping together and, and getting some traction um, are much better that way. Okay, I'm going to highlight just a couple of other figures um, since they're in my head and um, they're very impressive. Um, one of the things that stood out in the submission for this award was the amount of money that was spent on diversity efforts out of the school. Um, in the past three years, it's averaged about, it's now averaging about $1.3 million a year um, that are being invested in diversity efforts across um, the activities, the many activities at the Cronkite School. Um, they they uh, have uh, some high school journalism programs. We've got the Center for, that, that you run, Center for uh, Disability and Journalism um, that is headquartered here, the national headquarters, and doing lots of training programs. Um, so those are just, you know, a couple of little things that I, I was like, I, I need to make sure that I uh, talk about those. But let's talk about recruiting students. So you talked a little bit about retention and, and why that works. What are some ways that the Cronkite School is working to recruit students who might not normally think, I'm going to go into a career of in journalism because I don't see people like me represented in those careers? Can, can any of you talk about recruiting efforts? So you, you talk. Well, you, you know, you've read the report, then you. Do you have your I, mic? I, I, <laughs> You've read the report, then you probably know that um, that the Cronkite School has taken the approach to recruit at every level um, in the in the junior high schools. Okay, Anita Luera um, is the go-to person for that recruitment, and she starts at the at the high school level and uh, goes to school actually like a DJ she's like a popular DJ <laughs> she's in a van and it's 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 hip and it's cool and she goes to uh, various uh, schools again starting in seventh and eighth grade uh, and uh, gets students aware of the Cronkite school and gets them um, familiar with what we do so the seed is planted so that's, that's a great initiative, and it pays off, uh, because then they can look forward to the High School Journalism Institute. Right. And Which you guys, I think, have been doing since 1988. Many um, programs that started these in the 80s, they were pretty popular in journalism schools in the 80s that sadly are not in existence anymore. I will say at Alabama, we do have one that we started in 84, and it's still going strong, even though some of the foundation funding has gone away. We've been committed to it, and you guys have too, in keeping that, um, what, what, what used to be called minority 
uh, journalism program. We now call it a multicultural journalism program. And what is yours, your initiative called here? Well, it's a high school journalism institute. Okay. And, uh, it's, and it's every summer. Targets yeah. underrepresented groups. In, right. In, in yes, media. yes, yes, yes. And, and, and again, Anita Lear, you know, being the, 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 the seed, plants the seed. But I also want to say that individually, I know that all of us, you know, we, we have to recruit. Just to give you an example, last week I was at the Grace Academy um, in Tempe uh, talking to sixth, seventh, and eighth grade girls, uh, all girls, uh, about journalism. I invited, I was invited, I, hey, you invite me, I'll come. It doesn't necessarily have to be a party, it can just be a school. But uh, uh, the, the students were, so open because they didn't know anything about journalism. So we have to take advantage of wherever we can. Um, how do we recruit? I think all of us, uh, wherever we go, we're, we're talking about the Cronkite School. Cronkite School has great notoriety. So we, 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 we have to tell people what's going on at the Cronkite School, you know what I'm saying? But I, I, but I think that the fact that the Cronkite School starts early, and I know that I have for years done um, high school journalism institutes, you know. Right. But if you start in the eighth grade, can I, if I may ask? Sure. How many people in here were uh, aware of the Cronkite School from seventh to eighth grade? Okay, I got one, two, three. Okay, okay, that's okay, four. Yeah. Okay, so four people, that's good. So that gives you an example. Right. It exemplifies how you gotta reach out early. Right. And then they will, they, will, they will stay interested, but you gotta get them interested early. And then in terms of funding, from what I understand, when you're, when you're raising money for high school, for the High School Institute, and Kristen, you, may, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Callahan Aldean has said that is the easiest funding. Oh, yeah. Okay? That's what I thought. And that's it's very important. Well, he, It's amazing he, how many schools have... Have stopped? Have yeah, stopped. yeah. Well, they got to get on with it. Yeah. You, know, you know, yeah, you got to get with the program. Uh, because, you know, schools... I'm sorry. I just have to say, schools are always saying what they're going to do, and they got all this diversity planning, and they got committees, and they got strategies, and they got committees on top of committees, and meeting, meeting, meeting. But at the end of the day, it's about outcome. Yeah. It's about what have you achieved? What did, what right. Did you what have you achieved? Anybody can talk to talk, but walk and walk, and window dressing on the set. I'm sorry, I just had to add that. <laughs> Christina? Well, and I, I just want to sort of add to that. I think it really helps in recruitment when students come here and they can see, you know, um, faculty who are like them, and they can see other students who are like them, and they can see the people we put in leadership roles. They can see who we put on the air. They can see the types of stuff, or the types of stories that we're covering for Cronkite News. It's not just, it doesn't just fit one mold. And so I think that really helps to think, you know, if you're looking for a school and you want to be at a school that is inclusive, can you come and see all of our great offerings beyond, you know, the state of the art facilities and the, you know, just the, the credentials that we bring to the table? Um, you walk in and you say, okay, well, you know, that's cool and that's cool and that's cool. And, you know, and oh, you know, I'm, um, I can join this group and I can join that group. And, and you know that there's support there. Um, not to say that it sells itself, but that makes it really easy for us to walk out in the community and say, yeah, you have a place here, you know, come join us. And I think that starts from President Crow on down. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I'm a big believer in education for all, uh, no matter where you come from, what your background is, what your financial situation is. Um, and I know that when I was considering coming to the Cronkite School, that ethos from Dr. Crow trickling all the way down to our dean, Christopher Callahan, was a big reason why I ultimately decided, yes, this is the place I wanna be, because I saw a real and serious commitment to diversity and inclusion and the importance of that. And that's something that for me on a personal level, again, means a lot to me. Mm -hmm. And as Christina said, I, in my time here that I know of, I can't think of a single student or prospective student who really wants to come to the Cronkite School, um, but perhaps doesn't have the means or doesn't know how he or she might do that, and that there's not a full-on effort to figure out how we can get that person in here. Mm -hmm. Scholarships, funding, aid, special programs, you name it. Um, I mean, I've been so impressed by the efforts that I've seen, and we have groups that come in every single day into our Cronkite News newsroom. Um, I have folks who reach out to me almost daily via email. Hey, can I come in and, you know, check out the newsroom and talk to you? Absolutely, come right in. And I think that's a philosophy that a lot of the faculty members share here because it's important to them. 
That like transparency, I think, is okay. really, yeah, that is really cool. Because, you know, we will take anybody. Anybody can walk into Cronkite News and watch the newscast and talk to the students about what their experience is. And I think that really helps because it's real. It's, you know, we're not putting on a show. Well, we are putting on a show, but, you know, we're not, we're not putting on, you know, an act. Um, so I think, you know, the, the fact that we are truly committed to this, you know, rings true and people see it. Let me add one thing about the leadership. A real diversity commitment, a real inclusion commi commitment, has a stop has a start with the top down. Vanessa mentioned it uh, from from the president of this university, Michael Crow. Um, he has been very intense and very deliberately uh, in making speeches and 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 being supportive of inclusion at this university. I mean, he really has stuck his neck out a lot, and I, I, I don't know if, you, if you're aware of this, but then, then we have Dean Callahan, because if you don't have it from the top, and you just got a few people who are about diversity, mm -hmm. like when you said you were teaching race, gender, media courses, right, yeah. they grab you to teach it because you're a female, yeah. right? I, I yeah. also stuck my hand up. Oh, you put your yeah, hand so up, well that helps, volunteer. but oh, they really like you, yeah. because for so many, you can count the people who teach race, gender, media courses, they're temp typically women, Okay, and a lot of people of color. Right. So yeah, you, you, we do need that commitment from the top down. And the dean has his associate deans and his assistant deans in the Cronkite School and the faculty and staff on board with right. the inclusive mission at this school. Jennifer, if I could just add to that, I, and something I want to mention to our students here tonight is the importance of diversity within leadership. And looking forward to your careers, to your profession, to the kinds of jobs and aspirations that you want to go ahead and strive for, I really encourage you to think about that and think about the possibility of not only being journalists and reporters out on the field, but also of getting into those management positions uh, in newsrooms, whether it's TV, digital, across the country, or all over the world. Again, it comes from the top down. Um, you will hire people that will you know, bring in different perspectives and points of view um, into a newsroom if you have representatives at the top who recognize the importance and the value of having that in a newsroom. So again, I encourage you, don't be scared of management. Um, think about it because we're going to need you guys down the road to set the tone for the future journalists. Well, I can say that I have had a full day here at Cronkite School. So I started out this morning at 8.30 with a meeting with your provost, Mark Seal, down in Tempe um, at the campus. And then I went to the Office of Disability um, Services um, on the main campus, or I guess you guys don't call it main. <laughs> Tempe campus, sorry. Um, that was a faux pas from the visitor. Um, but did see that commitment to diversity in pretty much every place I went. And um, they're not lying about coming to see the Cronkite School. Uh, Cronkite newscast because I, I got to sit in and then there was a prospective student and his mother sitting in watching the newscast and we've got a, a new student who's starting in August. If you want to come see it, please come see uh, the Cronkite newscast and you can see what it's all about because um, the stories as that what they're saying up here and I'm an outsider, um, you know, what they're saying is absolutely the true. It was very diverse story selection, diverse reporters, producers, directors, you know, all the people involved in putting together that newscast is is it was a very visual representation of everything I'd been reading on paper before I came here. So I also did get um, the t-shirt with Sparky and the Cronkite School on it from the bookstore because I could not leave campus without getting one of those. So um, I'm going to ask kind of a provocative question. Um, and so I know I'm, I'm just trying to push buttons, but why does it even matter? Why, why do journalism schools need to do diversity? I mean, why, why is this important? Um, aren't we post-racial America? Haven't we solved this whole diversity thing? No. Um, yeah, that's what I'll I'm answer, I'll answer that really quickly. <laughs> just no. Does anyone um, think we're post-racial? Yes, I, I'm doing this just to push your buttons, because I will get that sometimes from students when there's a required diversity course in the curriculum. Why do we need to do this? We figured this all out. That was your generation that had these problems. We figured it out. So let's, we'll start, and I'm going to go um, uh, from Vanessa down this way. Why do we need to do diversity? Why does it matter? And why does it matter now? Because it's who we are, plain and simple, as a society, like Christina said. It matters because we are not, even though some people say we are, but we are not all created equal. We all come from, again, different backgrounds and different realities and different heritage and cultures. And all of that plays a very important part 
in creating the kind of societies and communities that we live in. And so to recognize the importance of that diversity within our community, and then to give it a place, to give it a seat at the table, again, specifically when it relates to journalism, is incredibly important. If you have a newsroom or a newspaper or a TV station that looks exactly the same from top to bottom, what kind of product do you think those folks are gonna put out? I mean, you might appeal to maybe 10, 20% of the population out there, but you've just excluded a vast majority of the folks who are out there who might actually want to tune in or read your content. And so, you know, thinking in terms of creating quality journalism, and then let's be honest, journalism to a certain extent is also a business. So it's also a smart business decision to want to make sure that you recognize the importance of diversity. So I think that's why, again, for me personally, diversity matters. And it, I don't know, just basic self-human respect to your neighbor and being kind to other folks who maybe not look like you, but you are open to the idea of engaging with these kinds of folks. There's a concept. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I think it's, you know, it's, it's not so much why it matters is like, how could it not matter? You know, our, our jobs are to tell untold stories, our jobs are to hold the powerful accountable. Um, and like Vanessa said, like how, how do we do that if everybody at the top looks the same? I mean, clearly we do not live in a post-racial um, America. And, and even though we've made, you know, a lot of strides and I think with each generation it gets better and better. Um, but even, you know, when, when I was growing up or, you know, at, um, at the newspaper, I remember, and this was not that long ago, um, and I was telling Kristen this the other day, one of our editors um, decided that um, we would not put a photo of a, um, a mixed race couple on the front page um, of the newspaper because um, there was fear that our audience would be uncomfortable. Um, so for those of us um, on the diversity committee and, and being a product of a mixed race um, marriage, we were like, are you kidding me? Like, why, how is that even a, a consideration um, in this day and age that you know that, that you would you would say no 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 this photo needs to go on the inside because we don't want and how long ago was yeah, that as my question um, yeah, when it was, was this? probably ten ish yeah so not not an, a huge amount of time has passed it was early two thousand something okay um, <clears throat> so you know it, and those are things that you, you know it, it's a fight that you still have to fight. Um, so, I mean, that's why it matters is because, you know, we, we don't live in a perfect world and I don't know that we will ever live in a perfect world. And so, you know, we need champions out there who aren't afraid to speak up and, and do the right thing. Speaking as someone who's not afraid to speak up, Sharon, do you want to <laughs> <clears throat> um, Most of the students that I teach were born just before the millennium and they came of age when there was a black man in the White House, when there was a black first family in the White House. And therefore, many students, many people, many Americans, many assume today that because of this racial image in the White House, and we've gone, the, the, the country certainly has had some racial progress, but they assume it is a post-racial uh, society. There's an ideology that promotes that, um, such that they um, never, they, they, they didn't know that, for example, black protests in sports is something that they had never heard of, whereas black protests in sports didn't start with Colin Kaepernick, but can be traced back to the 1930s Olympics when Adolf Hitler refused to recognize a black Olympian champion, Jesse Owens. I want to just give you an example to bring it home right here in this school that some of the students experience to talk about why diversity matters, because you know now more than ever diversity <clears throat> is important because at the highest levels of our nation, at our top leadership, the top leadership of our nation, we have a leader who has undermined uh, American journalism, has attacked American journalism, and so it, it has made our job a little bit tougher in some ways with this very polarized uh, uh, 
segments of the nation that we experience. But let me just share with you real quickly. And I wrote this down so that I could just hurry up and tell you. When, when some half a dozen of Arizona State University students covered President Trump's late August uh, summer return to Arizona to rally his base, this was at the downtown Phoenix Convention, it became for some students a turning point. That is, when the students returned from the Trump event, several said they were stunned and quite unprepared for the degrading assaults and heckling they received from some of the president's supporters at the event who hurled uh, vicious profanity, insults at them, and called them uh, fake news reporters. And um, even one student said that they were called the N-word. A bit shaken after the experience, several of the students said they questioned whether they even wanted to go into journalism after this. Uh, they said the convention center experience, particularly the verbal attacks, left them wondering how much journalism still matters and whether they still wanted to go in the field if, if this was a part of some. But others were resolved that they had to go into this more than ever because they see that there's work to be done. I gave you that example to say um, more than ever journalism has a place in our society because otherwise we risk a democracy. Any nation that does not have a free and responsible and a press that matters is a nation, is, is, it has a democracy that won't last. The, a democratic society has to have a press that's credible and a press that's working. Um, and when it's undermined, when the press is undermined at the highest level of society, it's very dangerous. <coughs> Um, so I, I just wanted to share that example for you because when, when I came to Cronkite School, um, and, and the research still shows this in some ways, the campus media, I don't know how many of you have been involved in any campus media, one more time. If you've been involved in campus media, let me see your hands. In any aspect of campus media, raise your hands. Okay, all right, okay. I see about 10 people raise their hands. When I came to the Cronkite School, as in many college journalism newsrooms, they were lily, it was lily white. And even now, if you want to do a thesis, let's check out the campus newsrooms and see how they are nationwide. Just see how they have progressed because they really have been some of the last bastions for segregation historically. Here in the Cronkite School, there have been mammoth strides. I mean, you know, we 24-hour newscast. But we have to be vigilant because we still have students who still may not know that they're welcome to take part in the newsroom. So we always have to make sure that invitation is over. We no, I don't, we no longer have the Association of Multicultural Journalists. Instead, we have the Association of Hispanic Journalists, Native American Journalists, uh, Latin, uh, 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 Asian American Journalists, and advisors, advisors here, okay? All right, so it is important that we have these organizations to make sure that our students are know that journalism matter and know that we support them in whatever they do. And I related this experience to you. There are other experiences out there, because, but it's important to just to share with you. Journalism that matters now more than ever in our history. Okay. Well, thank you all so very much for that. We've got about 12 minutes left, so we can have some questions from the audience. There's a microphone right in the middle. If somebody has a question for any of the panelists or, or me, we'd be happy to, to answer those. And we're all professors, so oh, we can come sit on. and wait. You guys are journalism students. <laughs> Let's go. Thank you. All right, so one question I had was that in the last presidential election here, was that a large proportion of, or I don't know what percentage exactly it was, but there's a huge proportion, percentage of white middle-aged males who felt like they were forgotten mm -hmm. in those last election by like progressive left. And so what bridges could we have to reach out to them to know that they're not forgotten? Well, I, I will tell you, I don't know if any of you all listened to This American Life, but they did a segment on a person who 
had voted for Obama in 2008, who was one of the leaders of the Charlottesville rally um, last summer in August. Um, and so what was the transition in that person's life? I think that was a very powerful and eye-opening segment, and it shows me what journalism done right could you know, help me understand what is going on in the mind of th that, that exact segment. It's you know, middle class or um, even lower middle class white males who feel like they've been left behind. And you know, where, where is the breakdown in our society that we're not understanding the concerns that they have had that have led them to this very you know, dark place of hate um, and division in our society? So that sort of depth and talking to people, the, the thing that struck me, I think, most about that, and This American Life, if any of how many of you guys listen to This American Life? So it tends to be, you know, it runs left. It's on NPR. Right, FYI, yes, yes. By so, the way. Um, the, 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 the compassion of the journalist to hear, and it was an African-American female, young African-American female journalist who was interviewing this person who was spewing hate towards, and it was on the phone, so he didn't know what color she was, but, um, she, and she debated, should I tell him that I'm black um, in, in all of this, but she showed compassion towards him and towards his feelings, and in, in trying to get him to tell his story so we could understand and have connections. And that's basically what we're supposed to be doing in journalism, is telling people's story so we can understand what's going on around us and make sense of it and try to make things better. So with that, I'll, do, you, do you guys have any thoughts? And that, please listen to that. It's on podcasts. It's I, an amazing. That, that's I, a really good question, yeah, I yeah. think. Um, the reasons why this part of our society feels the way they do is, I think, a completely different conversation. I think Jennifer summarized it very well. It's part of our job as journalists. Again, um, it, you know, that's a good question, and that's something that I've also sort of internally struggled with, because I don't want anybody to feel like they're being left out within diversity. Does that make sense? Right? Yeah, and then uh, there was really no judgment. I mean, because our, our quick place to go is to go to judgment when we hear that. And yes, things are reprehensible and terrible, but in order to hear the point of view, you had to get beyond your own personal judgment. And it was just a masterful example of her. You, you can hear her phone interviews with mm -hmm. this guy. So I think the press missed it. The American press missed it. They missed that picture. And they should have had it. Primarily non-urban, lower class whites who lived, many of them lived in rural areas, you know, um, um, uh, more than urban areas, I'm saying. Uh, but the press just was not on top of that because they were too busy looking at polls and not uh, people, you know. Sometimes we get lazy in reporting and we, 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 we rely too much on the quantified data and the analytics, but where are the people? I mean, Thank I you. think that's a perfect example of that was the untold story um, that summer, and it just, you know, happened like you, everybody was focused on the, all the other stories and not that one. So, I mean, like you said, it's it's everybody's included in that. No matter, you know, when we say diversity, it means everyone. So. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Kayla King Sumner. I'm a junior here at the Cronkite School. Um, given the uh, fact that the Cronkite's an excellent example of what diversity inclusion should look like in a journalism uh, program, what do you think uh, should be some of the long-term goals to even improve diversity in such an excellent program like this? The long-term goals to improve diversity in an excellent program like this. To, I'm sorry. to continue to promote diversity yeah, and also, inclusion. So, yeah, how do we exactly. keep going? Yeah, what, what are some of the, our long-term go goals? And, and I would say that I, I am fortunate enough now, I work, I've left the College of Communication in, and I'm working in central administration at the University of Alabama. And you can imagine, um, you know, look at your history books and the stand in the schoolhouse door with George Wallace um, to block integration of the University of Alabama. We have a long and ugly history with diversity and inclusion. Um, and, you know, that we have just hired our very first vice president for diversity, equity, and inclusion at the University of, of Alabama. I think the big thing, and Sharon kind of hit it on the Head and Christina said the same thing. Um, you know, there's work to be done. You can never be complacent. So, you know, if you hit that 50% with 
with women, is, is that enough? Um, if, you know, what, is, is it about a number? And, and even thinking of the diverse perspectives that people bring that can't be quantified and can't be put into a category, um, you know, that, that it, we should always be looking for faculty, staff, students who bring something different to the mix, whatever that might be. So I'm really curious, what do you think? Where do you think we need to improve? Um, I actually agree with you, Ms. Greer. I think there needs to be more research done on non-quantifiable information. So um, interviewing as many student faculty and staff um, members to get their perspective and their experience with diversity. That makes sense. You're saying, yeah, beyond the pie charts, beyond the bar graphs, beyond the statistics, what are the students saying individually? Where do we, let's look at some of that, um, not just the empirical data, the quantifying data, but the qualitative. What do their interviewing experiences look like, you know, when they come here, when they leave? Yeah, that makes sense. I'd like to see more diversity in our faculty down the road and also in our leadership as well. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Okay, we have time for one more, so. Hi, my name is Ariana T. I'm a junior and I'm a broadcast major. Um, so my question is pretty much for everyone on the panel. What are some personal challenges that you've gone through in journalism or in the workforce um, in concerns to diversity? Okay, I'm gonna start because I've been thinking about this story since we've been having this panel. I remember my very first professional job was with the Kansas City Star, first time um, job right out of University of Missouri. Um, and I was, I was all about getting the bylines. I just kept writing story after story and I was you know, 23 years old, newly married. Um, and I was called into the managing editor's office and said, well, you just keep writing all these stories and you're here late every day and you're working and you know, we really just think you need to go home and cook dinner for your husband. <laughs> this was in 1988, 89, right after I got married. You need to cook dinner, spend some time with your husband. <laughs> We're really concerned about you because you're working that hard. And I'm thinking they would have never said that to a man. You know, go home and cook dinner for your wife because you're working too hard in the office. Um, and they, they said it in a very paternal way. And I will tell you, one of the reasons I left journalism full time and, and went back and got my master's and PhD was because I did not see people who looked like me, somebody who was married with children in the leadership roles in the newspapers at that point. And so I left the field um, because that I could not see people, you know, that the women who had children were not in the newsroom, they were not leading the newsroom. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, and speaking of women with children, there was a time where if a woman got pregnant, they cannot teach. This is this is the historic. This is history in American education that when, if women got pregnant, they could not teach. But in the newsroom, sorry, in journalism, Vanessa. sorry, Vanessa. <laughs> uh, Thanks, guys. In the newsroom, in the newsroom, this has not been that long ago. Uh, if a woman was pregnant, you could not be an anchor woman. Now you see anchor women pregnant. You see meteorologists pregnant. In fact, you go like, is she pregnant? <laughs> You're always looking, <laughs> and, and and so I love that. You know, because 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 but because that's the point. When when are we going to get to where we don't have just oh the first woman that was pregnant on the air, the first woman that had kids and worked in the newsroom? When are we going to get to the fact where it's no big deal? You know, it's no big deal. We don't even have to talk about first anymore because it's common to have women pregnant. In my in I, when I worked at the Memphis Commercial Appeal, they actually. Uh, let go a female photographer because she got pregnant because they didn't feel that she could um, handle the job and be pregnant. You know, in those days, women weren't suing for discrimination. <laughs> they was like, "Oh, dang! I got to find another job after the baby." But um, um, so, so you know, we, we, trailblazers. We've we've had a, a lot of occasions, but I think I think what she has said encapsulate a lot. You know, that you come from a background where male dominated, and we're trying to change that, right? to make it a reflection of who we are and what we look like in here, you know. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I think a lot of my challenges were dealing with the public and sources too. And I mean, just today we got some phone calls, very angry phone calls from people who did not like our uh, Dreamer coverage um, and were very um, 
clear about why they did not like that. So, I mean, you get a lot of that that's just, um, you know, hateful speech, and it, it, it can wear on you as, as a human being does. But I think, you know, internally, in, in sort of my generation, when there was a lot of push for diversity, I always felt like a struggle at work was the backlash because of that, and that, oh, you're the, you're the minority hire. Um, and really feeling like you had to like prove yourself, no, I deserve to be here based on my skills, you know, not based on my background. Um, so that was always like to me, you know, whether you're a woman or whether you're, you know, minority or, you know, whatever the case may be, there was always that like, you know, you'd hear comments and people would say things and it's like, mm, you know, like that's, that's not it, you know, I, I deserve to be here and, you know, just because this company has this initiative, you know, why do you have to be like that, you know? And, and so, you know, that's, it's, it's really hard and, and I'm hoping things are, are better now. Yeah, you definitely don't want to be that token minority representative in the newsroom because nobody wants to be that person. I'll make mine quick. Um, my biggest challenge with diversity and everything that came after that actually happened when I arrived here. Um, <laughs> shocker. <laughs> Uh, it was it was a really interesting way to arrive in Arizona. I had been on air for two weeks, and as we all know, Arizona has a lot of local names, streets, villages, towns that are Spanish names. And so for me, it was absolutely normal and uh, nothing strange to say these words when I was anchoring, um, sometimes with their Spanish uh, pronunciation. And I really didn't think I was doing anything out of the ordinary or unusual, but I also think that at the time, this was in late August, early September of 2015, and that's right around the time that our current president announced his campaign, and so there was just a lot of rhetoric that was starting to be thrown around. Um, the atmosphere, as they say, was very hot and very charged, and I think that contributed to that. And we got backlash, the station got backlash, I got backlash, I was floored, I never expected it. Um, I think I, I know I defiant, defiantly went on air and said, this is who I am, this is how I've been raised. Um, I know change takes a while to get used to, but it's okay, um, and it's no big deal. And so we had to endure, again, the repercussions of that, and. I'm happy to say that at the time, the management that was there um, supported me, and I think that was huge. And again, the importance of leadership, recognizing the importance of something like that. Um, but that was a huge eye-opening experience for me, both on a professional level and on a personal level. And quite frankly, I think it's sort of, unbeknownst to me at the time, set up the path that led me to the Cronkite School and to do the kind of work that we do here and that I do here every single day with my students. You guys should Google that, because I remember watching it and was like, wow. Because, um, I mean, it was really powerful. Um, so Google it. Thank you. Watch Thank it. you. I, I will add that one of the challenges that students are now telling me that they have is like if when they write something or when you uh, are on air producing something, the, the, the pushback with trolls, with anti-inclusive, with, with anti-diversity people who wait for you to say anything about race, and then they pounce on you. This is problematic throughout a society. You know that. You know whatever you report, then you get this. You get, you know, you get hundreds of people who are just pouncing and waiting for you to use some word that has to do with race or gender or inclusiveness. Yeah, so that's a problem. It, when you the hashtag trolls. diversity in your tweets, yes. which I do a lot, <laughs> um, you will get those, yeah, trolls, those yeah. comments. So, yeah. okay, well, um, first of all, let's thank our panelists for the wonderful session they did. And then I'm going to give another congratulations to the Cronkite School for winning this award. Very well deserved and, and an um, example for all of us. And finally, I'm just going to thank all of you for, for coming tonight. It was a wonderful session.